Hey students, this is Professor Gore, and uh, this is part two of the Growth of Cities recorded lecture. And so in this part, we're going to talk about uh, what life was like for the upper class and middle class, uh, as well as the lower classes. And then also the big topic will be immigration. So um, really, as dress became more universal between economic and social classes, the upper middle class displayed their wealth really by, by membership in these kind of exclusive clubs. So if you're ever familiar with the country club, that's basically what you would um, see, except it would be more in an urban uh, area and so forth. These affluent neighborhoods tend to be away from the city center once better transportation came about, um, such as in uh, Milton and Newton in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, in Cincinnati, wealthy families settled in the scenic hills, rimming the crowded human tableland that ran down to the Ohio River. Residents of the area found a country clubs, downtown gentlemen's clubs, and a round of social activities for the pleasure of Cincinnati's elite. Um, if you look at this image right here, it, it, I've shown this image to you before in a previous lecture, but you look at uh, the image on the right, and that is a poor family. They're, they're shucking their own peas. Uh, you can see that it's, it's very simple, uh, simple uh, possessions, not very much uh, flash or anything. You can see the dirty, uh, their dirty clothes. The daughter is uh, uh, sneaking a pea in her mouth when her mom's not looking. On the left-hand side, this is more of an upper middle-class family. Um, you can see lots of nice material possessions, such as curtains, lamps. Look at their dress. Uh, the, the father and the daughter are playing chess. Uh, the family on the right never would have even time to play chess, much less even know how to play chess. So. Um, you can see the, the difference in, in how they lived. You can see a nice rug on the floor and so forth. Okay. Um, these are examples of some very wealthy people's homes. Um, this is Rockefeller's home in Cleveland, Ohio on the top right. Uh, the bottom right is uh, uh, William or George Vanderbilt's home. I'm going to show you a better picture of that in just a minute. Uh, but these are extremely wealthy people's homes. This right here is a picture I took um, back in, I believe it was 2010. My wife and I had just been married just over a year, and uh, we went on family vacation with uh, my side of the family. This is uh, George Vanderbilt's home. It is called the Biltmore Estate. Uh, I'm standing, when I took this Im image, about 300 yards away. Um, it took me, I had to stand that far back to get the entire house and the home. Uh, my wife and I went and toured it um, before we had children, but this this home is is five stories. Um, and I forgot how many square feet it is. But it's the largest home in America. It's, it's in um, just outside of Asheville, North Carolina. It's called the Biltmore. And George Vanderbilt was the grandson of Cornelius Vanderbilt, the famous railroad builder. It almost caused George to go broke building this. Um, and he began building it in the uh, 1880s. And uh, my wife and I toured it for about two hours, give or take. Um, of course, we stopped, took a break for lunch, and uh, the restaurant's actually in the form of horse stable. It's really cool. Um, but we toured it for about two hours and only saw three of the five floors. There's all these different secret passageways for the servants. Um, there were almost a thousand people that worked on the estate because the Vanderbilts had uh, the largest dairy farm, uh, I think, in the state of North Carolina on, on site. There's beautiful gardens and so forth. And you're talking about if you played hide and go seek in that house, you, you could never find uh, anybody because of, of all the secret passageways for the, the servants to come in and out of rooms. Um, George Vanderbilt's wife, on average, changed clothes about eight to eight to nine times a day, depending on what activity she was doing. Uh, it was incredible. Um, it is. They had a huge indoor swimming pool, which was revolutionary for that time. Um, spiral staircase. I mean, it is a gorgeous home. Uh, kind of reminds me of the uh, castle estate and Beauty and the Beast, but because there was like gargoyles or gargles that stick out, it was a, a very Victorian era home. Uh, but it, it is incredible. So if you get a chance to see it, please go to Asheville, North Carolina, and, and see that. Um, now, residents. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, some cities, however, had their upper class in the city centers like Chicago, Denver, uh, San Francisco and Manhattan. So at times, some cities, you had the wealthiest neighborhoods right there close to the city center. And then the factories were further out. Others, it was the opposite. The city center was the poverty, the factories and so forth. And then the, the affluent areas were further out. Um, 
So for those who've ever been to Dallas, Texas, um, the Highland Park, University Park, um, Preston Hollow neighborhoods are, are, are on the north side of Dallas. Uh, Highland Park's not very far from downtown. It's not right in the city center. Now they've rebuilt uh, uptown area of Dallas, just, just on the other side of Woodall Rogers Freeway. But um, da- that's pretty close to the city center, but not exactly the city center. Um, but in like New York and Manhattan, I mean, you look at some of the most affluent uh, and, and, and wealthy and most expensive apartments or, or condos are right there in, in Manhattan within walking distance of Central Park. So uh, it depends on what city you're in, kind of how it was like uh, and so forth. Some cities were not welcoming to new families of money. We're focused more on families that had money from past generations. So what we call old money versus new money. Uh, new York was quite different, causing many ma- millionaires to flock there. Many wealthy families, such as the Vanderbilts, constructed several lavish homes like uh, the, the Vanderbilts, you know, the, the Biltmore I just showed you. They also my wife has toured uh, one of their summer homes up uh, in Massachusetts um, and so forth. So they had summer cottages and a winter retreat uh, along with their primary residence. It's, it's incredible. Um, so with the um, suburbs. Uh, middle class was smaller in, in years past in the United States, but the Gilded Age brought a growth of the middle class who would play a very important role in the progressive era. Okay. And so who, what type of occupations were typically in the middle class? Well, you have managers, people that are managing other people, accountants, uh, one of the fastest growing uh, occupations for the middle class at that time, because you, you need to be able to track where all the money for business is going. Uh, clerks. Okay. So white collar uh, desk jobs, engineers, and engineers play an important role with all the infrastructure building and factory building and bridges and railroads and all kind of stuff. Uh, chemists, as we'll talk about, um, well, really in the second phase of the Industrial Revolution, you have the movement to steel, to electricity, and uh, chemical industries. Okay, so like Dow Chemical was a company that got started at this time. Um, and so chemists played a very important role in that. Designers, those that uh, designed, like architects, designed buildings, uh, clothing designers, and so forth. We see that as a huge money-making enterprise today. Uh, salesmen, okay. Sales is uh, one of um, a way to make incredible wealth for you and your family if you're really good at it, and depending on what product you're selling. Also, advertising executives. I mean, advertising companies are still uh, Fortune 500 companies like the Richards Group uh, in the Dallas area. Store managers, um, you know. People that are managers of Walmarts uh, make a really nice, uh, nice living. Targets, Kroger, you name it. Um, so store managers play an important role. And then regional managers of those store managers as well. Um, so you have a, a variety of occupations that helped uh, the middle class and, and grow and so forth. These salary positions increased sevenfold between 1870 and 1910. That is really one of the greatest benefits of, ind- of the second phase industrial revolution is it, it increases the middle class tremendously. Uh, nearly not, it really it, it increased the middle class more than any other, any other group, either even the upper class. Nearly 9 million people held white collar jobs in 1910, more than fourth of all employed Americans. Wow, if you have 25% of Americans in the middle class, no wonder the United States had one of the best economies in the world, period. It's, it's incredible. Uh, the geography of the suburbs was truly a map of class structure where a family lived, told you where it ranked socially. I could tell you that and the time my wife and I lived in Dallas, just what area of the city you lived in and so forth. Could, you could tell you your, your economic class. Um, as one proceeded out from the city center, the houses became finer, the lots larger and the inhabitants wealthier. You can see these uh, places like today, like West Little Rock or North Dallas. So, suburban homes were typically larger for the same money and came equipped with flush toilets, hot water, central heating and electricity by the turn of the century, which is awesome inventions. The poor individuals needed to live closer to work to cut down on public transportation costs and suburbs did lack the community life aspect that rural areas enjoyed. Uh, Suburbs are, and some suburbs are bringing that back, but others are not. Okay. Um, So it's pretty cool though, um, the innovations that develop at this time, but really middle, middle class families became smaller than lower class families with the typical family consists of a husband, wife, and three children by 1900. Today, the average American family is 2.5 kids. That's between two and three children. Okay, um, and so let's look at what middle class family life was uh, like at this time. Um, so we'll, let's talk about the wife's role first. Um, so because of if you those you've had me in um, U.S. History One, we talked about the cult of domesticity with the first phase of the Industrial Revolution 
And it continues in the second phase. Um, men left the home for the first time in large numbers to go work in factories, and even if they were middle-class management positions. Um, so the idea is that the cult of domesticity was is that the, the women's fear was in the home. They raise the children. They take care of cooking and cleaning. Uh, they, they take care of decorations. What's crazy is before the Industrial Revolution, what, what decorations and so forth there were, were advertised typically towards the husband because the husband was in a home and he and his wife made the decision. Um, after the Industrial Revolution began, they began marketing decorations towards females. They still do that today. You see this with HGTV and so forth. And so um, what's interesting is as the fiscal burdens of the household work eased, Higher quality homemaking became the ideal thanks to magazines like Ladies Home Journal and Good Housekeeping, which Good Housekeeping is still around. In fact, uh, my mother-in-law still reads it uh, and so forth. These began in the 1880s. Regardless of the higher quality homemaking, women experienced a subordinate role to men. Although the legal status of married women, their right to own property, control separate earnings, make contracts and get a divorce improved uh, markedly during the 19th century, law and custom still dictate a wife's submission to her husband. Many bright, independent-minded women rebelled against marriage, the mar and, and they were still the minority. The vast majority of women got married. The marriage rate fell to a low point in the last 40 years of the 1800s. More than 10% of women of, of marriageable age remained single, which was uh, like nothing had ever been seen. Okay, but still you have ju just under 90% still getting married. Um, and the rate was much higher among college graduates and professionals. Men also did not marry till much later with many men holding out and never marrying, about 10% never married. Still the vast majority of both men and women married with a much lower divorce rate than that of today, much lower. There, they also took place a, uh, a shift from manhood uh, to masculinity where men started playing sports like football and baseball, which is my personal favorite, uh, and also exercising and working out. Okay. Now um, let's also talk about uh, uh, changing views of women's sexuality. Um, as Pressure grew on women to work in the lower classes as well as middle class uh, focus on improved home life. Women wanted fewer children. Condoms of the time were associated with brothels, so few women used them. Uh, Anthony Comstock campaigned hard for the nation's most char uh, moral character to rise. Now, Anthony Comstock um, was really a uh, advocate for um, greater moral laws and so forth. And so um, he, he has get some laws passed at the state level and eventually spread across the nation, which really uh, we can agree in society are, are good things. So for instance, um, it's illegal to mail uh, pornographic images uh, to homes that don't subscribe to it. Okay. So for instance, let's say my children are going out uh, and getting the mail, which uh, my, my daughter likes to do that. Um, she wouldn't be opening up the mailbox and have some random pornographic magazine um, come to our, come to our house without a, a subscription or, and so forth. And so if you, if you wanted those things, then you could, you could subscribe to them, but uh, they were sending out flyers uh, of nude images to try to advertise, to get people to come to brothels where prostitutes were. It was terrible. Um, you could see a nude image uh, in a public place. I mean, you can imagine going to a grocery store and seeing a nude image. Those are, those are outlawed uh, with city ordinances and so forth. And so those are good things. Uh, prostitution is illegal today across the United States, except for two counties in Nevada. And so um, these are things that Anthony Comstock um, uh, advocated to prevent um, and, and so forth. And not just that, but, um, you know, increased alcohol consumption. Where can liquor stores be located? You, you don't want liquor stores right next to schools uh, for obvious reasons. Um, and various other uh, crimes and so forth, gambling. Um, you People um, had a big gambling addiction uh, at that time and, and so forth. Um, and it really was, he also tried to prevent preying on uh, uh, immigrants who maybe didn't speak the language who could be exploited and take advantage of. Um, so these are good things that develop uh, as a result of Anthony Comstock and so forth. Um, so, What's interesting um, as well, many doctors disproved of contraception at this time that fearing that taking away sex for procreation might release um, the sexual appetites of men to the detriment of their health and moral fiber of society. Around 1890, however, contraception became more acceptable uh, and reliable and so forth. Okay, this is in the health class, right? I'm going to detail about that. 
Um, now let's talk about attitudes, attitudes towards children. As incomes rose for families, children were no longer seen as just greater sources of income. So thankfully, child labor is going to be on decline. Um, Particularly when the 1910s rolls around, states started passing anti-child labor laws. They did pass a federal anti-child labor law uh, that we'll get to in the progressive era in module two, but um, it eventually gets declared unconstitutional, which is, I'll cover that reason why later. Um, so families were really responsible for providing a nurturing environment in which the young personality could grow and mature. Preparation for adulthood became increasingly linked to formal education. School enrollment went up 150% with, as a teacher. I'm, I'm thanked about or thankful about um, that happened between 1870 and 1900. And this is kind of cool for, for those that are taking my class, either as high school uh, concurrent enrollment or dual credit students or, or regular undergrads. Um, adolescence for the first time really came about during the Gilded Age and after. Uh, adolescents can now socialize with peer groups more than adults as they stayed in school longer. Uh, more and more high schools has appeared as time went on and girls in particular were able to stay in school longer than ever before. Like my grandmother, who was born in 1908 in uh, South uh, Arkansas. Um, she was the first person in family not to, to go to high school and she went to, to through 11th grade. She didn't graduate, but she went through 11th grade. And, and uh, in fact, until my dad went to college and graduated high school, nobody in his family had ever gone past the 11th grade. So uh, that that's kind of crazy um, how time has changed and so forth. Um, so really, what did what was the allure of the cities? OK, because a lot of rural people are going to be coming to these urban areas in the uh, late 1800s and early 1900s. Now, it, a lot of them, a lot of new people are going to be made up uh, of recent immigrants, but a lot of them are going to be made up of uh, people who from rural areas. One is you have a steady job. OK, you're not uh, uh, depending on um, the weather and so forth or rainfall for farming. Um, you also, if you could uh, advance yourself into middle class jobs, you could get higher wages than you could as a farmer. Uh, and some people just found the city life exciting, the entertainment, uh, the lights, the sounds. You know, they started developing the first amusement parks. You could go to baseball games and these big stadiums and so forth. Uh, well, they were big at that time. They were small compared to today. But um, and a lot of people didn't think the farm life was exciting and you weren't around enough people. And so you had extroverts that moved to the cities. And so forth. Now, um, so for women, what was opportunities like for women in urban areas? Well, you could go to school teaching. Okay. You could be, my mom was a teacher for 35 years. My sister is a speech pathologist in the school district um, and so forth. You could work in domestic service. Uh, they began increasing numbers of female doctors. In fact, there's a lot of female doctors today. Um, and women um, started getting, becoming lawyers. In fact, there's a lot of female lawyers today, but they were, they were a pretty small number at that time. But typists, telephone girls. Originally, operators were uh, made up of young boys, but they oftentimes used profanity, so they began using women as operators, librarians, uh, journalists, social workers. Um, and so you're going to have women increase in working from 2.5 to 8 million in a 30 year time span. Okay. Now, uh, in the Roaring Twenties, you have the flapper is kind of seen as the model um, woman at that time, or the most popular image of women. But in the late 200s, it was the Gibson girl. OK, now one thing to notice about their dress is they were um, didn't have long sleeves. That was revolutionary at that time. Notice how they put their hair up um, instead of wearing their hair long. Um, and they had really um, tight waist uh, on dresses. They had to use it as thing that tied it very closely. Uh, that was seen as the Victorian era woman and so forth. Now, um, other things that made city life attractive is telephones, okay, for communication, bright lights, electricity, uh, central heating, which would be awesome, especially if you live in the northern cities, public water systems, okay, uh, man, having um, indoor plumbing is incredible, uh, sewage disposal, asphalt payments, and transportation. Now, cities on the flip side, though, so a lot of uh, cool things about cities, but you also had slums, the highest crime rates in the world. Or, well, in the, in the country, I'd say not the world, but beggars, okay? A uh, lot more homeless people, pollution, horrible smells, grafters. You had the greatest rates of corruption in politics in urban areas versus rural areas, okay? Um, cities also began to develop beautiful parks. If you were into going to museums, particularly art museums, J.P. Morgan helped found um, one of the famous museums in New York, uh, libraries, thanks to Andrew Carnegie and others, uh, big, beautiful churches that were built, hospitals 
greatest medical care where it was in city. Still today, you look at where the best hospitals are, they're in urban areas. Um, also bigger schools that offer more courses. Still today, you, the largest high schools offer the most course um, uh, courses you can take. Uh, and also um, famous universities spring up in urban areas, okay? Now let's look at uh, uh, city life, immigration, and then lastly, political machines. Actually, I'm gonna cover political machines in part three. So the growth of cities create a new urban culture. Cities are divided into different districts for business, industry, and residential. I'll cover this in part one about different zoning. Um, but you also had um, not legal segregation like the Jim Crow South, but you had segregation based on race, ethnicity, and social class because of affordability. Um, and it's natural for um, immigrants to want to live where there are other people that speak the same language and practice the same religions as them. And so you have ethnic enclaves or what's called ghettos. Immigrants also found it appealing since they could create their, their culture, food, and hobbies of their homeland and ethnic neighborhoods. As much as 30% of the top American cities had immigrant populations. In Boston, it was Irish. In Minneapolis, it was Swedish. In most northern cities, it was German. And by 1910, ever more and more immigrants were coming from southern eastern Europe. In Chicago, Polish took the lead. In New York, it was Eastern Europeans uh, and also particularly Eastern European Jews. In San Francisco, you had a lot of Italians. Now, Italians came to the Eastern cities, but they also came to San Francisco as well. These new immigrants from Southern Eastern Europe either settled in outlying factory districts or settled in the congested downtown ghettos. These immigrant groups had their own newspapers and theaters and to provide help in times of sickness and death, the immigrants organized mutual aid societies, okay? So I want to show you some images of what city life was like. And these are images taken by uh, the photographer, Jacob Reese. Now, this is staged. Okay? He actually didn't catch these kids sleeping. It's, it was taken in the daytime. Um, but he took this image because homeless children would sleep in the street at night. Uh, there's, a, there's a really famous fictional story called Ragged Dick. Um, and it's written by Horatio Alger. It's a famous book. How to read it in college. It's a fascinating story. Um, Dick was this kid. Um, who was a boot black, which means he would make money by shining um, the boots and shoes of the upper and middle class uh, men working. He would try to offer that. Um, and um, it's, it's a really cool story. He was really witty and funny in, in the book. And, and so people naturally hired him to shine their shoes because they liked hearing him talk. And, and he was an interesting kid. But uh, it was about he was homeless and he would make money just to buy a meal. And if he had enough money, he would uh, buy a place to sleep for the night. Otherwise he slept in the street. Okay. This is a, uh, a congested uh, area. You can see all the push cart uh, sales people. A lot of immigrants had to um, end up owning push carts. These are children playing in a gutter next to a dead horse. Okay. That gives you an idea. Yuck. Um, so now this is a, a reason why a Jewish immigrant uh, came from Russia because of the pogroms. Pogroms are, are state-sponsored uh, persecution of a religious group, and it was aimed at Jews, um, and so forth. And this is one reason why Italian immigrants came. The main reason was bread. Um, you know, bread, um, the fact that you could eat two to three meals a day in the United States was incredible. These people were able to get one meal a day. Now, the old immigrants were primarily from Northern and uh, Western Europe or Central Europe. The new immigrants are coming primarily from Eastern and Southern Europe. So Italy, Greece, Bulgaria, Romania, uh, Poland, Russia, places like that. Okay. You can see that. Sorry, my PowerPoint messed up there. And so... You can see from this chart right here, how many are coming from uh, Northwestern, uh, Central, and then you see the rise from Southern and Eastern Europeans, particularly, man, that 1910 uh, to 1920 decade, a ton of immigrants were coming from Eastern and Southern Europe. Now you notice that number declines um, in the 1920s, and that is because of immigration restriction that we'll get to in a later module. You can see right here from this map, where the immigrants coming from. Germany made up probably the largest uh, at that time, but Italy, Aust the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and Russia are, um, are right behind it. And where are they going? Well, they're not going to the south. Uh, there were some that went to Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, and some of the coastal areas, but they are going to the north, uh, the Midwest, the Northeast, uh, the Great Plains states. They're going out west. 
uh, and so forth. Okay, um, so a lot of the ones that are coming as well from Southern Eastern Europe are Catholic or Jewish um, or something else. Um, the, those that came primarily from Northern and Western Europe were Protestant, and there's a lot of Catholics too coming from Central Europe as well, and also Irish uh, and so forth. So what were they received? Well, federal and state governments failed to do anything to handle the flood of immigrants because one thing, factory owners who helped control a lot of the politics uh, wanted the cheap flow of labor for cheap wages. Reformers try to help the immigrants in cities and try to bring about change uh, and so forth. Uh, Walter Rauschenbusch, who I'll show you a picture in just a minute, he was a pastor of a German Baptist church in New York City. He was a very famous reformer of the age who really tried to help uh, immigrants with um, a lot of charitable different things. And so um, you also have Jane Addams, who I'll cover in just a minute, who won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1931. Um, but let me show you this real quick. One of the reasons why uh, this anti-immigrant sentiment was aimed at Southern Eastern Europeans, the Southern Eastern Europeans that came um, were different than, um, besides the Irish, because the Irish were really poor um, and probably Catholic. But Southern Eastern Europeans, a lot of the ones that were came were some of the poorest immigrants ever come in, in American history. Um, they um, oftentimes resisted um, assimilation and um, a, some native born Americans feared that they would control things politically and whatnot. Also, um, you have a group coming, they were the minority, but they were still coming over from central, or sorry, from Southern Eastern European as a group called anarchists. Anarchists were the late 1800s, early 1900s uh, terrorists. Um, they they were uh, did this in Europe, and then, and then when they come to the United States, they do as well. In fact, one of them assassinated uh, President McKinley, that I'll cover in the, in the uh, uh, a later lecture, but they, um, thought that the way you enact government change, instead of doing the political process or protesting, you just um, use terrorist activities, you blow stuff up, you kill people, you assassinate, you use violence. Um, and so a lot of Americans feared that more Southern Eastern Europeans were going to be anarchists. And there were a growing number of anarchists that, that came. Now, they were in the low thousands, um, but and they were not the vast majority of Southern Eastern Europeans, but that, that was where they were portrayed. Um, this is kind of an interesting quote from a sociologist from the time. He says, observe immigrants and in their gatherings, you are struck by the fact that from 10 to 20 percent are here suit, low browed, big faced persons of obviously low mentality. They clearly b belong in skins and waddled huts at the, at the close of the Great Ice Age. These ox like men are descendants of those who always stayed behind. Now, that's a very racist point of view at that time from a sociologist. And you got to realize that social Darwinism. Um, and, and a lot of uh, people that were uh, struck by Darwinist worldview viewed that certain races were more advanced um, in evolution than others. And that is true racism. That's like what the Nazis were during World War II. This is a political cartoon of Uncle Sam sticking his nose up at an immigrant. He said, look at this Sabbath desecration. He's got a big keg on his back. So he's a big alcohol. He's got bomb of anarchy um, and so forth. Poverty, disease is where he's coming. He looks he looks short, um, not as well developed. He's wearing look like a yarmulke, so he's, they're saying he's Jewish. So there are so many things about this. Um, it's anti-Semitic, uh, very racist. And, and it wasn't just saying he was just Jewish. He was just talking about immigrants in general. But um, the fact that he had that cap on his head was trying to say, um, portray that. Here's another one about naturalization papers. They portray the immigrants as looking very ignorant. Um, and um, uh, saying that, that they are lesser uh, developed than other, other immigrant groups. Here's the other one. This is the, these wealthy barons and so forth that's portraying in their shadow as they were immigrants that came over to the United States decades before. Now, Emerson, um, here's the famous transcendentalist writer that we covered in US History 1. Um, he said the German Irish millions, like the Negro, have a great deal of guano in their destiny. They are ferried over uh, the Atlantic and carted over America to ditch and to drudge, to make corn cheap, and then to lie down prematurely to make a spot of green grass on the prairie. He was critical of them. President Glover C Cleveland, it is said that the quality of recent immigration is un undesirable. The, the time is quite within recent memory when the same thing was said of immigrants who had their descendants are now numbered among our best citizens. Cleveland was defending the immigrants. 
Now, where are the immigrants coming to primarily on the East Coast? Well, they're coming to New York. They're coming to Boston. They're coming to Baltimore. They're coming to Philadelphia. Uh, they're going to make their way to Chicago and other cities. Uh, on the West Coast, um, coming from Asia, they were going to San Francisco primarily. And so you had Ellis Island, uh, the most famous immigration center uh, in American history. Now, Angel Island was in San Francisco, so kind of a lesser known one on the West Coast. And so a lot of times immigrants that were coming to the United States um, that went through Ellis Island, um, if they if they had a name that was really long, like last name they couldn't pronounce, they would shorten it. So a lot of immigrants' last names got changed um, at Ellis Island and they would uh, take a, le uh, a loyalty oath and, and so forth. And they would take a test and to see if they were, um, uh, could be American citizens. You can see these immigrants are bringing everything they own in those bags. About 25% of immigrants worked in the U S uh, and then, and then uh, went back home. Uh, it could have been as much as 50%, depending in some areas and some immigrant groups. Um, the reason why they were wanting to make high wages, uh, maybe they missed home. And after they made high wages, they want to return or they didn't make it in the United States and so forth. Um, here are people getting a meal at Ellis Island. Here are people taking the allegiance to the United States. Here's another immigrant family. Uh, here's immigrants working in a sweatshop and a tenement. Here's another one. Looks like the um, person is picking their nose with the scissors. These are garment workers. Okay. Now let's look at um, this social gospel and the settlement house movement uh, because these are really, really cool in American history. Now, some historians refer to the social gospel movement as like the third great awakening in American history, but these are primarily Protestants um, who are going to, to do a lot of charitable aid to the poor. Okay, and we see this these charitable stuff uh, in cities across America. Um, and so it may not seem like, because if you're not uh, around charitable uh, acts and so forth, that, that the United States doesn't have it. Man, actually, statistically speaking, the United States is the most giving nation uh, in the world. Uh, great, Americans give a greater percentage of their income than any other country uh, in the world, which is pretty cool. So um, the, the reason why they call it the Third Great Awakening is particularly Protestant Christians realize, hey, um, there is a lot of urban problems and we need to be taking care of the poor, the homeless, the downtrodden, the abused women. Uh, and they developed uh, orphanage. Um, not until late 1800s did you have um, states take over uh, for like a foster care system, not until they're really in the 20th century because uh, churches took, took care of orphans and so forth. And so like uh, my, uh, I have some relatives that uh, foster their foster parents in the state of Arkansas and, and, and adopted um, uh, one of their children. And so this is kind of uh, near and dear to my family. And um, but they um, provided uh, soup kitchens and uh, try to give some training about job They have teach English classes, uh, taught them some some uh, immigrants came that were so poor, never used a fork. And so they taught them how to use uh, utensils, uh, try to teach them some American culture and so forth. And um, uh, really did some some incredible charitable aid uh, to these people had food kitchens and and. Uh, uh, food pantries and so forth where people could come get free food, um, job training, help them set up with, with that economic opportunity. Walter Rauschenbusch is probably one of the most famous uh, Protestant ministers who was part of this. Now, let's switch gears a little bit. Jane Addams and Gates Starr weren't necessarily um, tied to Protestant groups, but a lot of, there were other Selman Houses that were. What the Selman House movement was, is these were, would be homes that were um, uh, purchased, like Jane Addams was a wealthy widow. She purchased a uh, uh, the whole house in Chicago. And what she did is she took on immigrants. She would recruit uh, nurses to work at night to provide medical care for immigrants. Um, they would teach them English. Um, they would teach them how to eat properly in American um, culture and so forth. Um, they, um, they would also um, uh, provide English language training and, um, provide protection if they were homeless or uh, a battered uh, woman and so forth, uh, kind of help them get on their feet, teach them uh, American uh, culture and so forth. Um, and, and this is why Jan Adams won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's really one of the great acts of, of philanthropy and charity in American history. And Ellen Gates Starr does the same thing in New York uh, uh, with the Henry Street House. So the Selman House movement, uh, Jane Adams is almost always on, uh, gonna be on a test, uh, quizzes particularly when we get to the progressive era as well, but I introduced her in the Gilded Age, uh, but she continues into the progressive era as well. 
So the charity organization movement um, really pushed on on providing basic charity you would see today. Um, and But they wanted them to adopt and assimilate in American society. Social gospel movement is this third great awakening in American history using uh, uh, principles of Christianity to provide charity and justice to society's problems. Selman House movement, you've got to know that. Use the social gospel movement, the Selman House movement will be on a test, uh, particularly with progressive era and so forth. Okay, so make sure you take notes, star, underline the social gospel and someone else. Make sure you reread those in your textbook. Make sure you know exactly the difference between the two. Okay, and who Jane Adams is. Okay, and here's Walter Rauschenbusch. Here's Jane Adams on the left. And also, there's a picture of her as well. All right, last thing we're going to talk about for part two before we get to um, part three is nativism. Okay, so for those who've had me in U.S. History 1, we covered this in uh, Module 4 um, and uh, part of Module 3 as well. But basically, these people frequently were unwelcoming to new immigrants, especially the huge amount that started coming in the 1880s. The original Anglo-Saxons feared that the high immigrant birth rate of the new influx would lead to them being outnumbered, not voted. Nativists did not like new immigrants because they practiced different religions, had different languages and cultures, and were willing to work for lower wages. Because a lot of them felt like that they were um, economic challenges to their prosperity. It was, it was job competition. Um, labor unions are going to be some of the biggest nativists uh, at this time in American history uh, and so forth. So they didn't like uh, some of the different religions that were coming, different languages and culture, uh, work for lower wages. So big time job, com job, job, job competition is probably the biggest reasons why they didn't like them. Um, and... Uh, uh, Really, the American Protective Association was created in 1887, had a million members. They're voting against Roman Catholic candidates because they thought if Catholic can candidates were being um, elected, um, then they might lead to allowing the Pope to take over American politics, which is completely ridiculous. Um, I have a good friend of mine from grad school who is Catholic, and we, we would always laugh about this. Uh, but that was, that was a commonly thought. Um, they wanted protection from foreign labor. Labor unions uh, favored immigration restriction because most immigrants were used as strike breakers. They were willing to work for lower wages. They were difficult to unionize, and they were non-English speaking. Congress eventually prevented paupers, criminals, and convicts from coming in 1882, and later they prevented the insane, polygamists, those that had multiple spouses, prostitutes, alcoholics, anarchists, and people carrying contagious diseases. You, know, you don't want people carrying contagious diseases immigrating uh, to your country because it could spread to a pandemic. Many nativists wanted literacy tests, but it was, was vetoed by three different presidents. Uh, but it was finally enacted in 1917. Eventually, they, they do away with that in the civil rights movement. Congress tried to pass literacy tests, the quota system, and the gentleman's agreement to restrict immigration. Now, the gentleman's agreement uh, was done in 1907 under, with Teddy Roosevelt. I covered this really in Module 2, so I'm going to introduce this briefly. But um, what ended up happening is there was an earthquake in uh, the San Francisco uh, area. Uh, well, just in California in general, but it was near San Francisco. And the San Francisco school, school board um, had had no said damaged buildings. They took the white kids out of the school building. And this is this is terrible, especially as a teacher. This really bothers me. But um, they left uh, in the damaged building the uh, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese uh, children. So they're in, in a, an unsafe learning environment. Okay, which is wrong on so many levels. Now, Teddy Roosevelt found out about it because the Japanese government had sent a pretty scathing letter to him, and he was furious about it. He called the San Francisco, San Francisco School Board of D.C., gave them a butt chewing, and basically said, demanded that you put those children in a safe school environment uh, and, and quit being ridiculous. Now, because Roosevelt at the same time knew that there was kind of a rising rivalry taking place with Japan, um, he basically kind of made an agreement with the Japanese government it wasn't official. It was, it was kind of like a gentleman's handshake. Said, look, we will make sure, and I give you my pledge, that Japanese citizens on the West Coast will be treated better. Okay, now he fulfilled his end of the bargain, at least in his lifetime. And then his cousin, FDR, puts Japanese Americans into internment camps during World War II. But, um, and then Japan agreed that they would stop sending so many immigrants over there. Okay, a lot of Japanese that were poor were coming to work in the farms and, and the railroad industry, and a lot of them were going to Hawaii and working in the sugar plantations and so forth. And uh, basically, we'll treat your citizens better in exchange for you quit sending so many over. Okay, what's interesting is that Teddy Roosevelt predicted that the United States would eventually go to war with Japan, and that prediction came true when they attacked uh, 
Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. All right, we will come to Urban Blacks when we get to part three.